Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar title is Genetic Testing of Inherited Blood Disorders and Maximizing Clinical Utility by our presenter, Dr. Michael Chica. Please note that we won't take audio questions. If you'd like to submit a question, please submit it via the Q&A dialog box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Please feel free to ask a question at any time. All questions will be answered during the Q&A portion of our program after the presentation. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Chica has worked for Prevention Genetics for almost five years and served as director of the clinical laboratory for two years. Dr. Chica specializes in genetic testing of blood and lymphatic disorders, including thrombocytopenia, FHL, Fanconi anemia, and inherited forms of leukemia. At this time, I will hand it over to Dr. Chica. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I see we have a very diverse audience, which is wonderful. The plan today is to talk about three different blood disorders and how we test for these disorders at Prevention Genetics. I will also incorporate how we employ utilization management at Prevention Genetics in order to help our clients save time and money with testing. So a little bit about who we are first. Many of you already know us, but just give us, I just want to give ourselves a little bit of an introduction here. Uh, as many of you know, we are a clinical genetic testing laboratory in Marshfield, Wisconsin in the United States. We currently have the largest test, genetic test menu in North America, and we test samples from all over the world. Currently, we have 16 PhD level molecular geneticists on staff who specialize in hundreds of different disorders, including filiopathies, cardiovascular diseases, neuromuscular and neurologic disorders, metabolic disorders, skeletal disorders, and blood and lymph disorders, in addition to many others. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the blood disorders which we, for which we test at Prevention Genetics. So I'd like to go over the objectives of the presentation first. So. We're going to talk about three different blood disorders in particular, how we test for them, and how we use utilization management uh, to deal with these sometimes complex cases. I specifically want to talk about familial hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or FHL, Fanconi anemia, and thrombocytopenia. I want to talk about the disorders, but I want to focus on things that our team at Prevention Genetics uses to optimize testing for our clients. In the end, the right test is what the provider and the counselors and the patient and the family decide, but we're in a unique position as a service provider in the healthcare industry to help increase the clinical utility of our healthcare dollars. Part of our philosophy at Prevention Genetics is to never forget the patient and to make ourselves available to help sort out complicated situations. I'll touch on this philosophy a bit through presenting several different recent cases that I personally have dealt with. Also, we believe in having one low price and being transparent with our pricing. So all of our prices are listed on our website and what you see is what you're charged. You won't ever have to contact us for pricing if you don't want to, it's listed on our website. So regarding billing, this is one question I often get when I'm giving a presentation, is uh, do you accept insurance and do you do pre-authorizations? So I'd like to just address that immediately and say that yes, we accept insurance, so we're not a network for a lot of places. So a lot of times people are billed out of network, out of network and we do pre-authorizations. So with that, I'll continue on. Um, what we're looking at in this first slide are just a red blood cell, an activated platelet, and a leukocyte. Uh, that's a nice electron micrograph of those three cells. And those are the three types of cells that I'll be talking about a little bit today, mostly the activated platelet and a little bit about the uh, leukocyte. So let's start with hemophag hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, FHL. There's two types of FHL. Um, there's inherited and secondary. Hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, HLH. It's a rapidly progressing hyperinflammatory syndrome in which activated T cells and macrophages infiltrate numerous organs. As I mentioned, there's an inherited form and a sporadic form, and both can be triggered by viral or bacterial infections or other conditions, including hematologic malignancies. 
approximately 80% of patients show clinical symptoms in infancy, infancy, although some there's been some cases of late onset, anywhere from 20 to 60 years of age. The incidence is about 1 in 50,000 live births or 1 in 3,000 inpatient admissions. As a comparison, the incidence of Fanconia is approximately 1 in 151,000. And the incidence of von Willebrand disease, the most common inherited bleeding disorder, is about 1% or 1 in 100. FHL is characterized by hepatosplenomegaly and elevated liver function tests, uh, high soluble CD25 levels, diminished or absent lymphocyte cytotoxicity, prolonged fever, high serum iron. Uh, over 80% of the patients have anemia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, many patients have neurologic symptoms, seizures, ataxia, and HLH is characterized by uh, hemophagocytosis. Um, specifically, phagocytosis by macrophages of erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, and the precursors in bone marrow and other tissues. What we're looking at on the right-hand side here, if you look at the black arrow, uh, we're looking at uh, hemophagocytosis, uh, erythrophagocytosis in the spleen specifically. So that's a kind of a hallmark of FHL. In diagnosing FHL, it's important to know that there's 10 FHL or 10 FHL-related genes. So there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity with the disorder, but it's relatively homogeneous with its clinical phenotype. It's inherited in an autosomal recessive or an X-linked manner, and approximately five of the FHL genes account for around 90% of the FHL cases. So 10% are due to related disorders, such as Griselli syndrome, Chediak-Higashi syndrome, or hermansky pudlak syndrome type 2. So this is really uh, beneficial from a diagnostic standpoint because there's a very high clinical sensitivity specificity for genetic testing for FHL. I always like to go over the mechanism of a disorder just briefly whenever I'm discussing the genetics with with anybody, just so we get an idea of what's going on in the in the pathway to the disorder. So here we're looking at a cytotoxic T cell. In that T cell, we see cytolytic granules that contain perforin and granzyme, granzyme B. Those granules get targeted towards the plasma membrane of the T cell. They go through a polarization step, a docking step, and a priming step at the immunological synapse where they fuse and release the contents uh, into the target cell causing cell death. That's a very broad overview, but the important thing here is to note the proteins that are involved. So perforin is an FHL uh, gene and the protein perforin is a, is a cytolytic granule component. And the other genes that cause FHL, uh, the, other, the other genes that are associated with FHL, their protein products are involved in the polarization, the docking, the priming, and the fusion steps during uh, cytotoxic T cell um, uh, cytotoxic events. So if you look on the cytotoxic T cell, you can see RAB27A, MONK134, Syntaxin11, and MONK182 are all labeled, and those are all FHL genes. So importantly, FHL is really a, a syndrome in which we have overactivation of the immune response, but a lack of cytotoxicity, and so there's no negative feedback on the on the immune response. So what we get is just a hyperactive immune response and inflammation in various organs, mainly spleen, liver, uh, et cetera. So in diagnosing FHL, uh, we have to understand that without therapy, survival is, is pretty short. It can be a very severe disorder, uh, severe illness. Um, and really what we want to do is help confirm a clinical diagnosis and make a distinction between primary or secondary HLH. Uh, in other words, to determine whether it's genetic or whether it's due to some other extenuating circumstance. 
This helps us predict the risk of future occurrence in patients, define the risk in family members, and identify donors for hematopoietic stem cell transplants. It can also help with reproductive planning. So I'd like to just discuss a case with everybody to give everybody some perspective on, on how we deal with some of these cases at Prevention Genetics. So we recently had a case in which a one and a half month old female, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was reported to have severe Ill illness. Uh, symptoms included neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, prolonged fever, hepatosplenomegaly, elevated ferritin and triglycerides. And they ordered the FHL next-gen panel and reflex to del dupe testing. So the family structure is shown on the right, the proband. Uh, you see the arrow pointing to the proband. And uh, importantly, the proband had a three-year-old and a five-year-old unaffected uh, siblings, and I say unaffected because that's how it was reported, but we don't exactly know if that's the case, and I'll get to that in just a second. So through our testing, we found that the proband was heterozygous in the PERF1 gene for a pathogenic variant, and the variants are shown there on the bottom left, a variant of un unknown significance, and another variant of unknown significance, which is reported to have uh, which is reported to be hypomorphic and, quote, disease-modifying in a lot of the literature. So it presents a little bit of a complex case. We know that the parents are looking to find a donor and that the siblings are both HLA-matched for, for the proband. And so once we delivered the results to this family, we had a conversation with them uh, through our genetic counselors and suggested that they send in um, the, the sibling, samples from the siblings, but also samples from the parents so that we could really get a good view of what's occurring in this family with these genetic variants. So the family sent in the samples from from everybody else, and these are the results. So basically, you can see that everybody in the family is a carrier of something. Um, so when when they're deciding who is going to be a good person for a bone marrow transplant, all of this has to be taken into consideration. So they, the counselor in this case, called us and wanted to talk to us about it, and it's it's really kind of interesting for me because I get to sit there after I've done all the analysis and really discuss with with the recipients of the information on the other end, what's going on and, and how it affects them and, and other ways that we can decide, other ways that we can help and how we can participate. But in this case, they're, they're basically trying to figure out, okay, the brother and the sister of the affected individual are both carriers, but what is the, what is the condition of these variants? On the, you know, specifically, what is, the, what is the condition of the alleles in both of these individuals? So if we look at the situation a little bit more closely, what we see is that the five-year-old male we know has the C.694 CDT variant and C.272 variant in cis, and he got those from mom, and he got a good allele from the father. We see that the three-year-old female has C.227 G to A and C.272 in trans. Now the three-year-old is reportedly unaffected, but that three-year-old has two VUSs in trans, and one of which is a VUS that reportedly has some functional significance. So to me that's a little bit risky. So in going over all of this um, with the counselor, you know, I don't know what their best what their final decision is going to be, but at least with all the genetic information in front of them, it would appear that the three-year-old female is a riskier donor uh, for this particular case. Even though the brother has a documented pathogenic variant, we know that it's in, in cis with the other VUS. So the brother is presumably a true carrier and the sister could be affected but just not be showing a phenotype yet. So I guess the point here is that we have a panel test with a fast turnaround time, so we're able to find the variants in the proband, and then we offer targeted testing for the family members with a fast turnaround time. 
And so within a few weeks, we had information for this family. And time matters when time matters. So I'd like to move on and discuss Fanconi anemia uh, a little bit. So we test for a lot of Fanconi anemia. We do a lot of testing for Fanconi anemia patients at Prevention Genetics. Fanconi anemia is an inherited blood disorder that can lead to bone marrow failure and cancer. Uh, FA is considered a blood disorder, but it really affects all systems of the body. And it's a cancer predisposition disease. So patients with Fanconi anemia develop cancers decades earlier than the general population. It's estimated that the carrier frequency in the U.S. is 1 in 181, and the incident rate is about 100, is 1 in 131,000. Patients with Fanconi anemia usually present features by 12 years of, 12 years of age, and uh, the overall median lifespan is about 33 years, but some patients live into their 50s, and 80% reach 18 years of age. So it's a very, can be a very serious disorder. Uh, first signs might include fatigue, frequent infections, easy brewing, bruising, and hematopoietic manifestations. Approximately 60% of patients have at least one physical anomaly, such as sword stature, microcephaly, thumb and arm anomalies, uh, small head or eyes, cafe or lay spots, those types of things. And in these patients, there might be reason to suspect something is going on. But if you look at the other side of that number, that means about 40% of patients have no physical anomaly. So they may go undiagnosed for a long time or until they have a relative that's, undiag that's been diagnosed. That's risky because Fanconi anemia is a cancer predisposition order with early onset cancer. Uh, so specifically, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, patients with FA are at approximately 800 times higher risk of developing AML than the general population with an age of onset, median age of onset of about 13 years. Patients are also at a high risk for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, 500 to 700 times higher incidence of this is observed in FA patients compared to the general population. And again, it develops at an early age. So in addition, there's, there's other solid tumors that are associated with Fanconi anemia, um, tumors of the oral cavity, breast, brain, uh, kidney, neuroblastomas, lung. So it's really, it's really kind of an invasive um, cancer predisposition disorder. More than 80% of FA patients develop progressive bone, bone marrow failure. So uh, cancer predisposition, predisposition is really considered the biggest risk to FA patients. And this is why an accurate early diagnosis is crucial. The definitive test for FA is a chromosomal breakage test. So for this test, what we're looking at here on this particular slide, uh, for this test, some of the uh, patient's lymphocytes are treated with a chemical crosslinker, such as diepoxybutane, DEB, or mitomycin C. Uh, and what that does is it fuses the different strands of DNA together. So normal cells are able to correct for most of this type of DNA damage by unfusing the DNA strands. Uh, and, and people are not severely affected uh, by this. But FA cells, patients, cells from FA patients, uh, they're unable to, to correct this type of fusion and it results in chromosomal breakage. And so that's what we're looking at in this picture basically are just chromosomes that broke as a result of not being able to correct uh, cross linkage between DNA strands. That's what all these arrows are pointing towards. So there's 16 different uh, Fanconi anemia genes that have been identified so far, and mutations in those genes account for approximately 95% of the reported cases of Fanconi anemia. Fanconi anemia is inherited in an autosomal recessive or X-linked manner. And importantly, three genes, Fank A, Fank C, and Fank G, account for approximately 85% of Fanconi anemia patients worldwide. So a positive breakage test is a hallmark of Fanconi anemia. So after a positive breakage test, the next step in a lot of cases might be to determine which gene is the cause of the disorder or mutations in which gene are the cause of the dis disorder. 
And at the bottom, we're just looking at a distribution of the, the number of cases per gene. So you can see FANC A, C, and G make up the majority of the cases. And then um, the other 12, I'm sorry, uh, 13 genes just sort of make up the rest of the, uh, the pie graph there. But there's, what it means is that there's a relatively high sensitivity and specificity for um, genetic testing for FANC anemia. Again, I like to go over the mechanism a little bit. So the Fanconi anemia genes all work in a DNA damage repair pathway. And really quick, what we're looking at here is just um, uh, DNA that, had, that has been affected by, um, you know, it could be UV radiation, it could be a cross-linking agent, but it forms a cross-link between the strands of DNA. And uh, there's an FA core complex that gets recruited to the site of damage through its interactions with the MHF1 and MHF2 proteins. And so you can see the M, C, E, F, A, G, uh, all of those genes are Fanconi, all of those proteins are products of Fanconi anemia uh, genes. So those proteins get recruited to sites of DNA damage. Those proteins recruit what's called the ID2 complex. So FANC I and FANC D2 proteins get recruited to the site of damage. Those proteins are ubiquinated. If you look up in panel C, they recruit um, specialized endonucleases to incise the DNA. And if you look in panel D, you see that the monoubiquinated ID2 complex recruits DNA repair proteins, uh, including some other Fanconi anemia gene products, Fank E1, BRCA1, and eventually these proteins help to repair the cross linkage. And um, after the, after the damage is repaired, the proteins dissociate from the DNA complex. So diagnosing FA is heavily dependent upon genetics. Now originally. Complementation assays were used to identify the FA gene, and in those assays, um, people would typically culture patient lymphoblasts or fibroblasts uh, from, from, from patients and transform them with normal Fanconi anemia genes. And then they would identify which gene caused correction of the FA breakage phenotype. Um, that's kind of a long, expensive process, and it's not uh, something that works every time. So really, since the onset of um, next-gen sequencing, it's become a lot easier to just sequence the Fanconi anemia genes from patients all at one time and determine which gene is involved and what the mutation that's causing the disorder is all in the same, all in the same assay, so relatively quick turnaround time. So there's overall a, a lack of a genotype-phenotype correlation in Fanconi anemia. So siblings with the same gene variants may have very different manifestations of the disease. Uh, approximately 50% of individuals have no skeletal anomalies or no other very noticeable uh, anomaly, physical anomaly. So there may be siblings who are affected who don't know that they have Fanconi anemia until another sibling or somebody else in the family is diagnosed. So genotype is particularly important for some of the Fanconi anemia genes, such as FANC-D1, FANC-N, FANC-J, and FANC-O, because carriers of variants in these genes are at an increased risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. So many of, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of the increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer because of BRCA1 and some of the other genes that are listed there and the tests that are available for those. So who should be tested for Fanconi anemia? Well, FA is suspected uh, in basically anyone born with a skeletal abnormality and who develops aplastic anemia or leukemia at any age. Patients who develop cancers of the head and neck, gynecologic system or GI system, at an early age or without a uh, history of tobacco or alcohol use. And again, as I've stated a few times, siblings of FA patients should be tra tra 
should be tested even if they're presumed to be unaffected. Uh, patients with cytopenias who develop frequent infections should also be tested. And it's essential to test for Fanconi anemia before contemplating a stem cell transplant for aplastic anemia or treatment for cancer uh, because the standard chemotherapy and radiation protocols may provide may prove to be toxic to FA patients. So anything that can, can increase cross-linkage in cells, such as different types of chemotherapy and radiation, may be particularly detrimental to a patient who has uh, a cancer related to Fanconi anemia because of the, the mechanism. Uh, and again, children with bacterial H uh, should also be considered for testing. Early diagnosis is key with, with Fanconi anemia because it prevents inappropriate management of the disease uh, or other diseases uh, that, that have similar phenotypes to Fanconi anemia. Uh, it permits consideration of bone marrow transplant, uh, adrogen treatment, um, and other different uh, surgical interventions for solid tumors. And the bone marrow transplant can cure the blood phenotype, but patients are still at a risk for developing other cancers. Because remember, a bone marrow transplant essentially replaces the bone marrow, but the patient still harbors the, the Fanconi mutations in other cells of their body, so they're still at risk, high risk for other types of cancers. And it's important to identify can carriers for cancer surveillance and family planning. So again, I'd like to demonstrate um, how we test for Fanconi anemia at Prevention Genetics through examples. And we had a recent case where um, it, it really highlighted the need for quick, accurate diagnosis. Um, and, and it's really a good example of how utilization management can be applied to handling cases to make things run smoothly for the patient, for the parents, and, and for the family. So we had this proband. Uh, we received sample from a proband. Uh, the proband was two months old with atresia of the esophagus and duodenum polydactyly and had a positive chromosomal breakage test. So the family, or the clients rather, um, physicians, ordered Sanger sequencing for FANC A, FANC C, and FANC G. And in testing, they ordered a sequential test. So we tested the FANC A gene first, and we found a likely pathogenic variant in FANC A, but we did not find a second variant in that gene. So we called and discussed this with the clients, and suggested that they cancel the FANC C and FANC G testing and perform array CGH testing on the sample since uh, approximately 50% of the variants in FANC A patients are large deletions or duplications. So in other words, there's a good chance that if we cancel the FANC C and FANC G testing, we might find a large deletion or duplication in the FANC A gene and we wouldn't have to do any unnecessary testing for this patient. So after some discussion, um, the counselor and the physician, everybody agreed that that was the best route to go. Uh, and using our array CGH platform at Prevention Genetics, we found that the patient had a large deletion in the Fanconi A gene. And naturally, the parents wanted carrier testing following this. So the physician and the counselors ordered targeted testing for both the sequence variant and the array uh, detect the deletion that we detected by array in both of the parents. But in, here's where it's kind of, kind of neat for us uh, geneticists is we can take a step back and say, you know, actually what you can do is you can test the parents both first for one of the variants and then test the other. You can test one of the parents for both variants and then test the other for the one that you don't find in one of the parents, so in, in the first parent. So that's in fact what we did. So we were able to save them a little bit of money. And what we found is that the father harbored the sequence variant and we found that first. So then we recommended that the mother only test for the large deletion. 
So we did that and confirmed that she is, in fact, a carrier of that large deletion. And so in this case, we were able to save time and money by not performing any unnecessary tests for the parents. So the case gets a little bit more interesting in that the sister of the mother became pregnant during this process. And knowing that her sister is a carrier for Fanconi anemia, she wanted to find out her status. So importantly, we've already established that, that her sister is a carrier of the large deletion, so we know what to test the uh, the new family for, or the sister rather. And by the time we test the sister, we've developed we had already developed a PCR test for this particular deletion, um, knowing that the family might want to do more testing. So at this point, the sister found that she's she was a uh, carrier also for the large FANC A deletion. And so at this point, they can decide whether they want to test the father for a FANCA carrier status or not. But the point of this is that both families know what testing is relevant, and they can make decisions regarding how they'd like to proceed. So for, for my end, it's really just looking at all the pieces of a puzzle and putting it together. Because uh, really, we want to diagnose things quickly and minimize cost. So in this particular case, if we look at how everything was handled uh, by active management on our end, rather than just uh, looking at what has been ordered and and ordering exactly that without um, really thinking it through and discussing it with the clients, uh, we're able to save a lot of money and time for this family. So um, what we were able to do is cancel unnecessary testing for FANC C and FANC G in the proband. Uh, we performed deletion duplication testing for FANC A on the proband. We sequentially tested the parents, so we saved time and money there. And when we performed targeted carrier testing for the maternal aunt who was pregnant, which we had already developed a PCR test for, which is a lot cheaper than, than array testing. So for this particular family, we really saved time, months of time, and over $4,000. Um, four thousand dollars of their money that they didn't have to put towards unnecessary testing, and it's it's not always a, a one test equals one answer situation. Uh, this clearly demonstrates how sometimes it becomes more complicated. But um, in this case, performing the right tests actually resulted in performing fewer tests. So finally, I'd like to move on to thrombocytopenias. Before we look at thrombocytopenias, I think it's helpful to go over briefly the process of hemostasis. So when there's an injury to a blood vessel, uh, three broad things occur. There's a neuronal response and a blood vessel constriction. There's platelet aggregation and a coagulation cascade that all lead to formation of a stable hemostatic plug. When a person has a bleeding disorder, one needs to establish which one of these uh, aberrations in which of these particular uh, processes are the cause of that disorder. And there are different biochemical tests to determine uh, whether the cause of the disorder is neuronal, whether it's a platelet issue, or whether it's a coagulation cascade issue. But the tests don't always identify the specific problem or the genetic basis. So if we look at this in a different light, uh, there's several different causes for excessive bleeding, uh, the vascular thrombocytopenia and coagulopathies. And within each of those categories, there's multiple disorders that, can, that are related to that particular cause of, of bleeding. So for example, um, thrombocytopenias can arise from idiopathic thrombocytopenia or from a number of syndromic forms, including thrombocytopedia absent radius or TAR syndrome, we've got Aldrich syndrome and other forms. So specifically today, I wanna to focus on that middle group there, and we're gonna look at thrombocytopenias, uh, different thrombocytopenias and, and how we test for those at prevention genetics. Thrombocytopenia is a condition of low platelet count. 
Uh, generally below 150 times 10 to the 9 per liter is considered to be thrombocytopenic. Uh, it's important to distinguish inherited thrombocytopenias from other causes of thrombocytopenia, such as leukemia, uh, bacterial or viral infections, and conditions that increase breakdown of platelets, including pregnancy, uh, ITP, and responses to medications. So there is at least 18 different genetic disorders that have been identified so far with thrombocytopenia as a primary characteristic. In general, thrombocytopenias, inherited thrombocytopenias, are not something that just show up acutely in adults. They're congenital disorders. Patients with thrombocytopenia uh, experience easier excessive bruising, superficial bleeding in the skin uh, that appears as a rash, pinpoint sized reddish dots called petechia. Uh, they experience long bleeding from, prolonged bleeding from cuts, often experience spontaneous bleeding from gums or the nose, uh, sometimes have blood in urine or stool, unusually heavy menstrual flows, and profuse bleeding during surgery or after dental work. So the, there's several challenges in diagnosing thrombocytopenias. So because thrombocytopenia can be associated with a variety of different conditions, um, it's important to establish which form a particular patient has in order to determine the best treatment options for that patient. So the classic example in this case is comparing congenital amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia to TAR syndrome or thrombocytopenia with absent radius. So in CAMT, patients always present with a severe thrombocytopenia at birth and rapidly progress to trilineage bone marrow failure that benefits from a bone marrow transplant. Thrombocytopenia is also severe at birth in TAR syndrome, but platelet counts often improve over the first year of life and eventually approach normal levels. So only supportive treatment is usually required. So we wouldn't want to give a person with TAR syndrome a bone marrow transplant if they don't need it. So the point is that the cause is often unclear, and the clinician is faced with distinguishing among many possible causes of thrombocytopenia, determining the risks of bleeding, thrombosis, and other potential complications in a particular patient. Diagnosis of thrombocytopenia typically involves assessment of blood smears and narrowing down the possibilities based on uh, different abnormalities observed in the blood smears. And what we're looking at here are uh, three categories of, or three anomalies that are often observed in thrombocytopenias. So thrombocytopenias are typically characterized by the presence of large platelets or macrothrombocytopenia, presence of small platelets, microthrombocytopenia, or the presence of normal platelets. So in this particular example, what we're looking at on the right-hand side in panels A and B, we see an image of normal platelets. So those are the small little, um, little uh, cell fragments in between the other cells there. In panel C and D, we're looking at thrombocytopenia with large platelets. Panel E shows the large platelets with leukocyte inclusions that are typical of MYH9 related disorders. Panel F, we're looking at large platelets from a patient with Bernard Soulier syndrome. In panels G and H, you see vacuolated large platelets, which are typical in patients with GATA1-related thrombocytopenia. And in panel I, you can see that the platelets have a grayish appearance, and those are typical of patients with gray platelet syndrome or thrombocytopenia related to the NBEAL2 gene. So over half of the inherited thrombocytopenias are syndromic disorders with additional symptoms, and this is just a diagram showing which other tissues and systems of the body can be affected in the different syndromic forms of thrombocytopenia. So for example, we see that MYH9 related disorders are often associated with kidney defects and um, you, you know there's 
with thrombocytopenia with absent radius, there's often heart defects that are associated with that. So importantly, some of the thrombocytopenias are associated with an increased risk in malignancy. So for example, RONX1, a gene that's related to thrombocytopenia, the incidence of MDS or AML in individuals with germline RONX1 mutations is over 40%. So the, the point here is that all of these different types of thrombocytopenia require different monitoring and different treatments. So it's important to identify the cause of thrombocytopenia in any given patient. If some of the extra hematopoietic symptoms can be identified, then specific genes of interest can be targeted for testing, which saves time and money. For example, we get a lot of tests that prevent genetics for MYH9-related disorders because the patient has a blood smear with a very obvious pathology of large platelets and leukocyte inclusion bodies. Even defining platelets uh, just based on size, breaking it down to large, small, or normal platelet size will narrow down the relevant tests for a particular patient. So what we're looking at here is a list of genes associated with macrothrombocytopenia or large thrombocytopenias. And we often get a request for tests for many of these genes at one time, uh, but I might notice something on the requisition form that indicates that it may be better to start with a particular gene first if they're doing sequential testing, or maybe to focus on one gene rather than ordering an entire panel um, because there's, a, there's an obvious phenotype. So for example, if, if a patient, if it's listed in the requisition form that the patient has large platelets with a gray appearance, you know, they might wanna just test the NBL2 gene or uh, VPS16B or VPS33B instead of testing an entire panel. So in this, in this uh, slide, what we're looking at are uh, genes associated with normal size platelets. And many of the thrombocytopenias with predisposition to cancer fall within this category. So RUNX1, ANCRD26, uh, MPL. And so finally, the last category are thrombocytopenias associated with small platelets. So Wiscott Aldrich syndrome is a thrombocytopenia associated with small platelets, and it's inherited in an X link manner. So family history is also an important factor in determining which tests are relevant. If we have a rec form that comes into prevention genetics with a list of thrombocytopenia genes and clinical features, uh, and it indicates that you know the patient's male, they have small platelets, they're immunodeficient, they have a family history of thrombocytopenia, and it's showing that a maternal uncle uh, or maternal uncles also have thrombocytopenia, we might recommend starting with the WASH gene rather than other genes. It's a little bit of a complicated slide, and it's an algorithm that's typically used for diagnosing thrombocytopenias. But the important thing to, that I want to point out in this slide is if you look on the right-hand side, it's really what this slide is doing is it's looking at things and saying, okay, is this a syndromic form of thrombocytopenia or is it a non-syndromic form of thrombocytopenia? So if it's syndromic, try and find out some of the other relevant features of the disorder so we can narrow it down to a particular gene. If, if it's non-syndromic and there's not really much known about it, well then you might wanna take a different testing, uh, or different, different route to testing. So you may wanna test an entire panel versus a specific gene. So if we keep this in mind when people call with questions and when we receive tests, we can really help direct the testing needs of our clients rather than um, just always performing panel tests with a lot of unnecessary testing. So who should be tested for thrombocytopenias? So patients with bleeding, diathesis, easy bruising, frequent nosebleeds, prolonged bleeding, patients with any symptoms of disorders associated with thrombocytopenia and abnormal blood smears, patients with a family history of thrombocytopenia, and related disorders, including leukemia, should all be tested. It's 
important to distinguish inherited thrombocytopenia from ITP or other types to allow for proper management. One of the treatments for ITP is um, a splenectomy, so we wouldn't want somebody to have their spleen removed if they have an inherited form of the disorder. So, you know, really having a genetic test and identifying the genetic component, if there is one uh, identifiable for a particular thrombocytopenia is, is a definitely a valuable um, piece of information for patients. It dictates uh, general management, it dictates the management of the disorder and um, what might be important for rectifying the situation. So for example, a patient with a RUNX1 mutation might want to have a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So it's important to identify that as a cause of the disorder. So I'd like to finish by just going through one of the thrombocytopenia cases that we had recently. The, and recently we had a patient call. They called our genetic counselors and they gave them the following information. They said that uh, basically they had a patient, a female patient, uh, with CML that was Philadelphia chromosome positive, a family history of AML, the mother had AM, MDS, AML, uh, and a bone marrow showed trisomy 8, monosomy 7, and ring 13. And basically the counselor asked, do you have any tests for this? So the counselor, um, I'm sorry, the, the physician asked, do you have any tests for this? And so the counselor on our end at Prevention Genetics passed this along to me. And really what I did is I just said, okay, well, we might. So is there a bleeding phenotype? And if so, what we might want to do is start with the RUNX1 gene because mutations in that gene are highly penetrant and there's a high incidence of leukemia associated with that. And often there's other cytogenetic anomalies associated with that disorder. And then we might want to reflex to other genes that are also um, considered leukemia risks, such as CEBPA and ANCRD26, and then reflex through other tests as needed. So there's been several occasions where I've seen orders from multiple thrombocytopenia genes, but the information that they're providing for us really, really seems to narrow it down to one or two genes that, that we can start with first. Now there's a lot of value to doing large panels, um, but sometimes if we can narrow it down and focus on one specific gene, uh, we can get we can get a lot more testing done uh, and save the client some some money and time. So today we covered uh, familial hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, Fanconi anemia, and thrombocytopenias. Uh, if you have any, if you have the desire to look up any more information about these tests, I would just direct you to our website, preventiongenetics.com. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and you can look at our quarterly newsletters and look for regular test updates. And if you'd like to be on that list, please send an email to uh, Rachel Christ uh, at PreventionGenetics.com, Rachel.Christ at PreventionGenetics.com, and she can get you on those lists. So that'll keep you posted on all the new stuff that that is coming from Prevention Genetics. So at this time, I guess I will try to answer just a few questions. I think we're running a little bit long on time, so. Maybe we'll just take one or two quick questions here, and then any other questions you have that I do not address, please feel free to email those, and I'll address them in an email. As far as the questions, uh, please submit questions via the Q&A dialog box in the bottom right corner of your screen, and then Mike will go ahead and answer them. Okay, first question in here uh, says, how about testing for ALPS? Uh, we're developing a test for that now, so uh, that should be available soon. Uh, 
Okay, there's also a question here about uh, the slides after the presentation. We have recorded this presentation and we'll be posting it up on our website. So a recording of this presentation will be available after it's completed. Okay, one more question. Uh, will you have a panel for lymphomas, lymphomas familial? Eventually, yes. Um, so currently we don't. We have genes for uh, myeloid leukemias right now, but uh, eventually we hope to develop one for uh, lymphomas as well. So um, I can't give an exact timeline for that, but it's in the process. So. Um, keep checking our website and our test updates for that. Um, or if you have any other questions, you can contact me directly at uh, michael.chika, C-H-I-C-K-A, at preventiongenetics.com. Okay, one more question is, are you thinking of developing a panel for myelodysplastic syndrome? We are, in fact. Uh, that panel test is almost ready. So um, we've, we've got all of the genes that are currently associated with MDS, AML, uh, familial MDS, AML on a next-gen panel, and we hope to have that available very soon. So please keep checking our website for that. Okay, and that looks like about all of our questions, um, so that's gonna conclude our event. Uh, there is a short survey at the conclusion of the event. Please take a moment, it's only two questions. Your feedback would be greatly appreciated, and thank you again for joining us.